evolutionary, ladies and gentlemen, the secret process of the age, the medical discovery of the age. This snake oil will cure anything that ails you. Regular doctors don't believe it. Medicine man, old-fashioned style. Hoaxster, snake oil salesman, loud-talking hustler who promises everything and delivers nothing. That snake oil he's selling wouldn't cure a flea bite, but he sure got a lot of customers. Just listen to him. I promise you that this particular formula will make you a superman, bigger and stronger than anybody else. And remember, it will bring you strength to joy. Medicine man, hoaxster, Nazi style. Death insurance salesman. He too had a big sucker list, millions and millions of them. Hoaxter, patron of the big lie. Today, Germany, tomorrow, the world. <laughs> The hoaxsters, the mad medicine men of history, made their pitch. They made a promise of a bright new world. Hitler, kaput. I promise you that this is the most potent, the most powerful brand in the world. This secret revolutionary formula makes every man a king. Medicine man, fascist style. Hoaxster, another snake oil salesman with millions of victims. They advertised an elixir of peace and prosperity for the old and the young. Mussolini, morto. I've got the secret formula. So buy it. Buy it now. Don't be a weakling. Be a leader. Medicine man, militarist style. Hoaxster, totalitarian teller of tall tales. The victims listen, the snake oil keeps flowing. Shining illusions of world glory and conquest. Tojo, shy. Today, from a grave in Lund Highgate Cemetery, comes the ghostly promise of another medicine man, another hoaxster. In the 19th century, he redistilled history and philosophy into a concept of class revolution. A bitter and cynical old appeal to bitter and cynical men. These words are the perverted cornerstone of Karl Marx. Let the ruling classes tremble at the communist revolution. The proletariats have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries, unite! This fourth pitchman of the apocalypse still rides, bringing with him the same old snake oil which has brought millions to their knees and to their graves. The only difference is that his bottle has a different label, a red one. And its name is... Peace Parade in Moscow. Advertising the same old snake oil. They're all pretty much alike, aren't they? The pomp, the power, the panoply, the supranationalism, the one-leader principle. Yes, they're all alike. We know that. We've known it a long time. The Soviet Union is a matter of practical fact, known to you and known to all the world. It's run by a dictatorship, a dictatorship as absolute as any other dictatorship in the world. There's no between dictators. If you believe in the one, you lean toward the other. They're all alike. And I'm opposed to fascism as I am opposed to communism. The Communist Party of the United States is a fifth column if there ever was one. There is no doubt that aggressive communism threatens all freedom and all security in the new world, just as they did when they were aligned with the Nazis. Communists teach that America is a vicious enemy of humanity. This is a philosophy worthy of 
some witch doctor. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It is a lie. It is a big lie. fascist hatred and contempt for religion was appalling. In like manner, the godlessness of communism. Totalitarian territory, the one-party system. See Germany, the voter had his choice of Hitler, 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 or Hitler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In communist Russia, the same system, the one-party system. It's either Stalin, 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 or Stalin. Da, 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 da. In enemy countries of World War II, concentration camps swarmed with slaves. The totalitarians packed untold millions of their own behind bars to smother even the faintest whisper of opposition or difference of opinion. We can show you no pictures of slave camps in communist Russia because the Politburo has dropped the iron curtain on this evil official red activity. But the American Federation of Labor, in conjunction with friendly governments, made a documented survey and it is now certain that 14 million, 14 million forced laborers crawl under the iron boot of the Soviet Slave Labor Trust. The dots on this map represent known locations of communist concentration camps. Inside America in 1940 were American citizens who on behalf of a foreign nation with whom we were at peace plotted the violent overthrow of the United States government. They were Nazis, American Nazis. Inside America today are American citizens who on behalf of a foreign nation with whom we are at peace, plotted the violent overthrow of the United States government. They are communists, American communists. They were apprehended and jailed by the FBI. The big try of the three-headed monster known as the Axis to split up the world three ways hardly needs telling. We were there. They tried to conquer the universe the hard way by a shooting war. And they came up empty. The communists began their big try at World Conway by feeding on the poverty of World War II by trading shabby ideas for a half-filled cup of coffee, by political coercion, pressure, and intimidation. In 1917, the Bolsheviks overthrew the moderate Kerensky government, which had unseated a fumbling and undemocratic czarist regime. This counter-revolt tragically enslaved the Russian people to the deeply radical forces of Bolshevism and imposed upon the Russians the iron grip of totalitarianism. Their credo, based on Karl Marx and expressed by their leader, Lenin, proclaimed, Democracy and communism cannot live side by side. 
Communist parties were rampant in Paris, in Brussels, and all over the continent of Europe. And even we, here in America, were not overlooked. In 1919, the Yankee edition of the CP was founded in Chicago. Yes, 33 years ago, they made their first try at us. And... Round two began on an imploring note, with the Reds making overtures side world in an effort to get help for the mother country. The party realized that Russia could not survive if it devoted its energies to world revolution. In this period, Lenin died and Stalin took over. His first move was the establishment of the five-year plan, designed to build up the strength of the mother country before the big try at the countries that surrounded it. This was the era of happy public relations, based on the thesis that liberties would be extended as the economy improved. In 1929, the happy boom days ended for us. The depression was here. This was what the communists were waiting for. Said Stalin, Russia's number one communist, the revolutionary crisis is not yet arrived in the United States, but there are already numerous indications which lead us to believe it is near. Said William Zeter, America's number one communist. Under the dictatorship, all of the capitalist parties Republican, Democratic, Progressive, Socialist, etc., will be the Communist Party function alone as the party of the toiling masses. Again, we saw a typical red reversal of the party line, for we were inching our way out of the Depression. Our domestic economy was definitely on the upbeat. The Soviets, obviously, on the downbeat. They needed help at home, they needed help abroad, because the Nazis and the fascists were stealing the territories the Reds wanted for themselves. Although we were strongly anti-totalitarian by instinct and by choice, the totalitarian communists now became, temporarily, anti-totalitarian by design. Their agents infiltrated and took over many legitimate anti-Nazi and anti-fascist organizations and formed other illegitimate anti-totalitarian organizations with one motive, defend the Soviet Union. This was the brave new world of tomorrow. The die was cast for World War II. The Soviets blithely renounced their professed friendship for the democracies and at once expressed their violent enmity. The Western world was appalled, as Molotov said, Germany is a state which is striving for peace while Britain and France are in favor of continuing the war. The Nazi invasion of Poland was the moment of decision for the Western democracies. They decided to fight. And while King George gazed out into a threatening sea, praying for help in Britain's fight against the German Blitzkrieg, the communists were sabotaging all democratic efforts to wage effective war against their blood brothers, the Nazis. A 24-hour picket line was established outside the White House. Communists stirred up strikes in defense plants. And overnight, the anti-Nazi leagues were deserted by the Reds, who now joined their totalitarian brothers, the Nazis, in a vicious Hate America campaign. On June 21st, 1941, the Soviet Union again reversed its stand and expressed its deep affection for the United States. For on that date, Hitler laid a heavy hand upon his fellow gangster, Stalin. The unholy romance between Nazi and communist ended with a sudden... Back here in the United States, the Communist Party line changed immediately. The Soviets were again anti-Nazi, very anti-Nazi. They needed help. So the picket line in front of the White House vanished. Then one Sunday morning, while we were happily anticipating the arrival of Christmas, 
We were now at war. And amongst our allies was the Red Army. Politics in war make strange bedfellows. But many of us thought perhaps a common ordeal by fire might melt the cold, calculating communist contempt for democracy. And when the last angry shot of the war ended, we turned to our Red Allies and waited. We waited and, brother, we got it. With the war over, the Reds who had marched with us as allies suddenly, just like that, stopped, slipped their gears into reverse, and started marching backwards again, abruptly ending the pretended collaboration of communism with the democratic world. The Kremlin relayed the word via its stateside fish wrapper, the Daily Worker, that the international honeymoon was finished. The early American citizenry, which hewed a nation from a wilderness, built a set of principles that became the pattern of freedom for all men everywhere on earth. Today, that pattern still holds, for we are a strong, robust, growing nation with a deep reservoir of material and natural resources. But our greatest strength, our greatest resource, is our spirit and our faith our undying, unremitting belief in freedom. We are a people raised in the heritage of free ideas, and these ideas of democracy and freedom can eventually force communism to abandon its twisted delusion of world domination. But in continuing to make communism ineffective, we must not betray our own principles. For there are violent, angry voices in the land homegrown tyrants who play the reckless game of slander in order to achieve other ends. It is not enough to be anti-communist. That doesn't mark the measure of a man's love for democracy. Remember, Hitler was an anti-communist and accomplished his Nazi reign of hate and terror by the violence of his cries against communism. What we are for is important. Beware the hoaxers with different bottles to sell. Beware the fearful gossip mongers, He's a communist. the lunatic fringe, What's his religion? the calamity howlers, He's a fascist. the ersatz patriots, He's a liberal, a bleeding heart, a do-gooder, the hate smith. He reads too much. He talks just like a college professor. The grubby demagogues screaming for the crackpot vote. I'm 100% American. I'm 200% American. 300%. 400%. 500%. 600 percent, that's what my snake oil is, 600 too. Don't Amid the clang and clatter of Don't clashing fight. ideologies, is still heard the voice of the hoaxer, trying to destroy America in the name of America. But the multitudes who once listened to this voice of doom have dwindled down to a mere handful. For no hoax, by whatever name it is called, can measure up to the shining truth of the human decency we call freedom of the human hope we call liberty. Mm -hmm.